Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Closers, winners, losers, they're all the same. Because you want to know that 3, 12, and 1, we love everybody. And again, this is Tim. This is OGR bringing you the best in New York Giants content. It's 3, 12, and 1, the 2022 season. OGR, you're looking dapper today. You're looking I am. Dapper. I am. I am promoting Plainville soccer somewhere. Yes. Um, not because I want to, because I was in a rush to record. You're, you're in a rush, and we're not talking Getty Lee. We're just talking a rush to be here because everyone wants to be here because you know what? The season's fast approaching. you got rookies coming in. Not manana, but on Friday. Seeing what they do. Getting measured, getting their helmets, getting all that fun stuff. Rookie mini camp. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. I want to talk about something right off the bat. And no more ferality. I want to go right into it. James, Bradbury. James Bradbury. There's been a lot of speculation that the Giants did him dirty. They cut him when they knew they were going to cut him. They basically came out a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away and said, we are getting rid of this guy. He does not fit into our plans. They don't cut him in March. They don't cut him in April. They don't cut him in May. Well, they do cut him in May. But they cut him after the draft when all the money from free agency is gone. Teams have selected their newfound talent, and now they let him go in the open market. Ingenious, genius move by Joe Judge. Do you see where Joe this Judge? is going, Tim? Joe Judge or Joe Shane? Sorry, Shane. I said I called him Joe Judge the other day. No, it happens. Hopefully, it, happens. it was a Freudian slip, uh, or not a Freudian slip. It'll be about Freudian slip about ten more times on this podcast. But what do you think of that? Did, did they did they do him dirty? He was he was a consummate professional. He came in here, yeah, he took the money. And he played, he played well that first season. He played okay last year. But I still think he was worth his contract. We just couldn't afford it. But if you knew you are going to dump him, why would you do it after the draft? And basically say, you know what? We know we're getting ready. Yeah. I'm thinking that, you know, they're hoping by the slimmest margins that no other team finds value in James Bradbury. And they're like, they come in at the last second and swoop him up. Yeah, it's not going to be the case, but that's what I think Joe Shane was going for. Even the slightest margin to try and bring this guy back. But, I mean, he Shane gave all indications that Bradbury was not in the in the plans of the Giants. Do we need a James Bradbury type at the CB1 position? Of course, because I don't trust Adore Jackson. I don't trust Aaron Robinson. I don't trust Mr. Flott. There's a lot of people I don't trust, so I would have liked to have had him, but there was no way in, hell, no way in God's green earth that we could bring him back. But what would be the difference if you knew back in April you couldn't – or you knew at the beginning of April you you were getting nothing for this guy. And it's not like an injury was going to occur. If it was like leading up to the season we were in training camp and an injury occurred, then someone would reach out and trade for him. But it's not like you're going to get an injury in March. Honestly, that's all I can think is the Giants did, did. I mean, kind of in a way, it, they did him dirty because I think they really wanted to resign him. They knew that he, you know, wasn't going to budge on his deal or anything like that. It is what it is. And the Giants were just like, okay, well, you're not going to work with us. That's fine. Because I guarantee Joe Shane was going to him, like, listen, you're not the same player that you signed for. He did. Now, a lot of people will speculate and say, okay, it could be the pass rush. Maybe it is the lack of a pass rush. Absolutely. And I know that's where you're probably going to go to as well, Tim. But it also could be the guy lost a step. The guy's pushing 30. That's usually when he's corners 28. Are going. He's 28. That's not pushing 29 30. in six months is pushing 30. He's 28. I am pushing 38, Tim. I am 37. Listen, they say, especially in football, and this isn't me, this is doctors and other people, that your athletic peak is between 27 and 29. So technically, he would be going into his athletic peak years. Technically, he would. But some players don't go into their athletic That's peak true. between 27 and 29. Some actually go into their – they begin the decline at 27 and 29. That's why the average age – or the average length of an NFL career is 2.5 years. Then, yeah, that's that 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 pretty much that pretty much sums it up. I personally think it was the pass rush, like you brought up. I personally think that the league figured out Patrick Graham. 
and and they he he did not adjust, like we always talk about second year players adjusting that he did not adjust to the league adjusting to adjusting to him he tried to run the same shit over and over again and i think that i think that would led to his um his i don't want to say demise because i would still say he was a top 15 corner absolutely i still think he's a top 15 corner or at least there's a top 15 corner in there and i think he could have done well for this team if he would have stayed but it's not the case it's neither here nor there it's gone so we all know the draft wrapped up we all know we're we're going to be heading into like i said the the rookie mini camp um there's a lot of speculation on um on this draft class there's a lot of hype on this draft class there's a lot of other um uh i don't want to say there's 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 multitudes of experts on youtube on twitter and you're going to love this topic. <laughs> you're going to love this topic because this is one of my favorite topics. And I, I have people send me clips of things. And it's people breaking down college film of our draft choices and trying to relate to it or translate it into the NFL. Now, I've said this a million times before. I do not break down film. I don't do film, film breakdowns. I did film breakdowns for three and a half seasons in the NFL. I did. I did it for a living. I charted film for a living and I don't do it. But then you have these experts who are breaking down film and giving this not wealth of knowledge and information who have probably never played the game, who probably never even, even strapped on a helmet or even a motorcycle helmet and are telling people that this is what's doing this. But the worst thing that, that bothers the shit out of me is they're trying to translate what they did or didn't do in college to the pros. I've said this a million times. When you are done with college, college is over. Stats don't matter. What you did in college and how you played doesn't matter because it doesn't transition over to the NFL because you may be on a college team playing the Home Depot team. Why? <laughs> and I know it's for the clicks. I know it's for the likes. I know it's for the bleeps and the bloops. And I know it's for the monetary reasons. But why, OGR? And then people follow this shit like it's gospel wow tim Sorry. you are pumped up tonight you're like a lion that's about to swim into the ocean and eat a tuna code red tonight baby i was just got out of the gym it was code red new oh, when I, I always love did you order red. the code red i <laughs> you're damn right i did <laughs> Sorry. But, but i i don't know i don't know so the reality is talk to me down you know what? There are guys out there that break down film. They're called actual experts, actual NFL players, or coaches. If, if Bill Belichick's breaking down film of our draft picks, which he's not, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, I don't know. I didn't look at the Patriots draft board. I don't have insider information. But the reality is if somebody like that's breaking down film, I'll listen. If you have some sort of experience, if you have some college or NFL experience, like yourself, Tim, I'll listen. But if you're Joe Schmo that has no credentials, a la me, breaking down film, don't listen to him. But you I don't, don't know what I'm talking about. You don't I'm break down my film. Opinion. You're smart I'm enough. My opinion. You're smart enough not to do it. <laughs> I'll give you my opinion. I'll look at film and I'll give you my layman thought and be like, this guy doesn't have any hands. When in reality, this guy is like all over the field and has like the best hands ever. Right. But I just happened to watch one highlight where he was like, he missed a guy totally. Crazy. Right. Well, crazy. my thing, my my thing is this, and it's I I've said this a million times before. And the reason why I did my YouTube channel was to give out information from a from a rational perspective and from an honest perspective. And I think when people do things like that, like break down film and say, well, you know, if you, if you look at uh, Wondell Robinson and look how he played against this team here and how he cut his zone and did this and did that, it doesn't matter because it's not going to translate into the NFL because everyone in the NFL has talent. Not everyone in college football has talent. I want to interrupt you for two seconds. Sure, go ahead. Okay. You are talking to a fan base that has the mind of a 10 year old. Not all of them. Not oh, all of them. Oh God, you know, I didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> but up. seriously, a lot of the Giants fans I encounter think they're going to the Super Bowl every year. I a saw lot of Giant fans this, I, I encounter think we're getting 11 and 12 wins. Yep. You know what they are? Not diehard fans that have logical opinions. They don't, especially in the Twitter sphere. It's fly by your seat of your fan on the Twitter sphere. The reality is 
Not a lot of people are saying what we're saying. We are not the popular part of this giant station period. We give you the opposite opinion. My mom says I'm popular. Well, that's your mom. <laughs> she doesn't have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> she said mean, she says mean things to me sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder why. Are you sitting in her driveway revving your Harley or something? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very sustained possibility. But I'm just saying this, OGR. And I, and this is kind of where I you actually led into what I wanted to talk about briefly. And I've talked about this in the past. Is it the younger fans? Because Twitter, not Twitter, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, MySpace, whatever the hell it is, is, is usually for people in, either in their 20s or some, a lot of times in their teens. Is it a disservice to the younger fans that, that rely on this information? Back in my day, because I'm old. Back in my day, it was ESPN. Tim, you're a spring chicken, please. I remember when ESPN came out. Okay? I remember when it came on to cable. I think it was 81. And you that was what you had, but you had experts, real experts, people, former NFL players, coaches, giving you this information. And now the younger fan relies on the YouTube, the Twitter, the Instagram. They rely on that not only for their football knowledge, but for their sometimes opinions. Is that a dis is this becoming a disservice to that younger generation, which may lead to the reason why they have the attention span of a 10 year old per OGR, not me. All right. If you're a new giants fan, if you're a giants fan that only knows Eli Manning, mm -hmm. I want you to stop right now. I want you to turn off the Twitter. Keep the okay. YouTube on and look up Giants history. Go on Wikipedia. Look at previous records. Look at the lifetime of Giants. If you're a Giants fan, you should know the history of your Giants. If you are a diehard Giants fan, I'm going to ask Tim a question right now, and he is going to give me all the starting quarterbacks of the Giants in less than 15 seconds. All the starting the quarterbacks? All the starting quarterbacks has started a Super Bowl for the Giants. I will I will give you a pass on Eli because Eli Eli, Ma Eli Manning, Jeff Hostetler, Phil Sims, Kerry Collins. That's a diehard fan right there. If you're a diehard fan, you and, and I don't care if you have one Super Bowl or ten, you should know every starting quarterback right off the bat. Why? Because you know your history, you know your Giants. If you're a young fan, learn the history of the Giants because the Giants have not always been sunshine and rainbows. No. The Giants have gone through 20 years of fans wearing bags over their heads in the stands. Especially if you live through the 70s. The reality is that's what the Giants are a put on your hard hat and go to work kind of team. And thing, and they always don't go the way the, of the NFL. What you think is hot, what you think is cool, what you think is trendy is not what the Giants are. The Giants are blue collar. And go look up the blue, go look up the word blue collar, and you understand what the Giants are all about. That is Giants football. That's who we are. We we set trends that the other the, that the other teams follow. That's who the Giants are, and that's what we need to get back to. I love it the other day because I did a stream, and someone mentioned that the Giants have never had a league MVP. And I had to explain to this person: the Giants have actually had two players that won two league MVPs <laughs> each. And I and I don't understand. I don't think people need to understand who Y.A. Tittle and Chuck and Charlie Conley is, but it's the fact that you, sh to your point, you should know some of the history of your team. You should know where this team started and where this team came from, and where it's progressing to. And I think that, and I think that makes for a better fan base. Because you know what, I know Steeler fans. My family, my family grew up in a basically in in a coal mining town. My my parents, and so most of the people are Steeler fans. And, I, and I've talked to Steeler fans a lot because they're family members. And I'll tell you, they know history of the Steelers. They, they, they know going back beyond Bradshaw. And I laugh because, you know, people are like, well, you know a lot about the Steelers. Well, I said, yeah, because they're like, you know about Mark Malone and Cliff Stout and all these guys. Well, how do you know? That? I said, because of the fact that I listen to when they talk. Because they are a wealth of information about their team. And they know what their team is, what it's done, where it's been, where it's going, and where it may be at. 10 years from now. 
Absolutely. And the other thing is, most people don't know that Lawrence Taylor won MVP yep. and Defensive Player of the Year in 1986. Yep. And that is, that is a stat we'll probably never, never ever again. rival the Aaron. But you'll never see another defensive player MVP. And as good as Aaron Donald is, he's tied for the MVP, but he's not league MVP. No. No, and the, and and that's and that's the thing. Not and like I said, we are not. I I do not think we're bashing all giant fans. We're not. Again, uh, you know what? It's called constructive criticism. And in this day and age, people need to learn about it. Seriously. I was gonna I was gonna spit up my water on that <laughs> on that one because I don't know how well that's gonna go over. But but that's that's all right. You know what? Tim, and Tim, go ahead. if you're a Giants fan out there and you're offended by what I'm saying, it's you. Because it's, you're not offended by what I'm saying. No. I, I can name you about a 10 other content creators that love me for my opinion. Right. Because I am the way I am. It's the reality not, it's is, me. I, the rea- reality is I'm blue collar. I put my hard hat every day, literally, and I go to work. And it is not all sunshine and rainbows. No. So that's how I live my life. Because no matter how hard you hit, life hits harder. <laughs> it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Oh, that's God. not you. <laughs> That's not how I raised you. Ah, sorry. A little Rocky Balboa moment there. (laughs) It's a mean, nasty place that'll keep you down if you let it. I was watching. It's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard hard you can get hit and get back up again. And keep keep moving forward. Or whatever, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, All right, I got it. Come on. Come on. I'm I'm sorry. I'm rusty. I'm rusty. That's what she she said. (laughs) Don't make me... (laughs) Don't make me take out my anger on you today. I'm trying not to. Uh, so we have rookie mini camp coming up. And, you know, know, and it's it's three days of nothing, really. It's three days of getting fitted with your helmets, grabbing your playbook, running, you know, putting some, you know, putting shorts on with your helmet and running around. Nothing, nothing spectacular. It's always fun to to you know to watch, I guess, to get an to get an idea and to see these kids. It is there any player? Right now, and it does. It could be any player. It could be one of the first round draft choices. It could be anything. Is there any player that you are truly interested in right now to see anything, or just see them in general going into rookie minicamp? I'm interested about the corners and the safeties. That's going to be one of the biggest question marks for the Giants. It wasn't once upon a time, and even last year, it probably really wasn't all that much. But now. We need a lot of corners and safeties to step up, and I'm eager to see these guys, any of these guys that we drafted, that we're bringing in as undrafted free agents. Corker comes to mind. Um, see what everybody's you talking about. Corker. Everybody is. Everybody's talking about me. Everyone's talking about this kid. Now I'm going to ask you a question because I, I evidently don't. I don't know a lot about him. I haven't done any research on him. I'm going to be honest about that. But I've said this a million times before. You are an undrafted free agent for a reason. He's an undrafted free agent because he does not technically fit in the modern NFL. Okay. What what, what what NFL does he fit in? He fits in 1980 NFL where okay. I'm going to I'm going to push your face into your into the back of your helmet. Okay. Um he he's a guy that comes up, he comes up and hits, he's in the box safety and he's not great in coverage. And you need and you need a guy that can do both. Jabril Peppers, even though not the greatest guy in coverage, have the ability to do both. Good cover. Corker, Corker is going to need to get better. He's not the greatest athlete, but he's a guy who's very instinctual, reads and reacts. But sometimes he over pursues. Do you he's know a very you know raw? He he's a very raw player at Kentucky. How big? And is he? Do you know his size and weight? I think he's actually typical size for um thing, but I'll just double check. He's him. typical he's size. He's he's yeah. average. What are you what are you looking at him for a police sketch? He was average officer. He was average, average height and average weight. I know. I, I've done a little thing. I just haven't done the measurables on corporate to be totally honest. God, man, you're supposed to be prepared for questions like you don't know I'm asking. Oh God, yeah. Well, you know what, Tim? You know, a little a little time before the the uh thing would help. He's 5'11", 204 pounds. So he really can't shift over to a linebacker position. He's not a Sam Mills. Yeah. Okay. So that that was my question. I was like, because you bring up Peppers. Peppers that first season played sixty seven percent of the snaps in the box, and, and that's what he was doing last year as well before he got hurt. But he was actually going out more into coverage, which was allowing Xavier McKinney to roam. So it's not a bad thing. And what Patrick Graham, of course, did that first year is he used his safeties as quasi linebackers. 
Now that we're not going to do that this year because it's going to be an entirely different defense. That's why I was curious if he had the size and the weight to sit there in the middle of the field. No, he doesn't, but he definitely can come in the box. He's not afraid to hit. He's a decent tackler. Um, it's interesting to see if this kid can develop, and that's why I kind of pointed him out because a lot of these, a lot of these corners in safeties, we are going to ask. We're going to ask a lot of them in their rookie season, uh, and the guys that are second or third year guys in the roster as well. I, I like it. I, li- I like because I, I hear that name a lot myself. I'm looking at Wandale Robinson. Oh, I knew that. I knew that was coming for oh. any, but 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 for but for a different reason. I want to see how tall he actually is. They list him at. It's funny when they list someone at five eight, and you still think that's too tall. <laughs> I am hey, curious. Five eight is the average size of the average man. I'm not an average man. Neither am I. <laughs> so, but that's not the average size of an NFL wide receiver. I no, mean, there's not. There, there are not. There's not a plethora of five eight wide receivers. There's some, but not a plethora. Whatever they drafted this guy for, whatever purpose, he better hit the ground running. That's all I'm saying. I think he's. I think he's going to need to, and I think he needs to figure it out quickly. You quickly broached on the subject of the cornerback position. We, uh, we we are a little light, I would say, in safety. But we're also, while we have a stable of players, I think we are still light in regards to we need to bring somebody in. We need we need to br- we need if you got rid of a Dory, not rid of Dory. I'm sorry, if you got rid of James. You need a veteran presence. Correct. I personally looked. I scanned the waiver wire. You know, people that come to my mind immediately is Jimmy Smith. Same of course, he's 32 years old. He played for Wink for, for what four or six years? I don't remember off the bat, on top of my head. I'm getting blown up here on the cell phone, of course. Um, but it's it's one of those things that while he may not be a permanent solution, while he may not even be a, a full time solution for an entire season, I think he's the veteran presence that he could come in, teach the Wink system, maybe start for four, five, six games, and then let the other guys come in. Is there any? corner out there vis-a-vis even a trade or free agent that you think is on the open market that could fit into the giant system i just gotta check if this guy's still available um but i think fuller is available i'm not sure though but he might jeff fuller kyle fuller kyle fuller kyle fuller Fuller. yes kyle fuller i believe is still available and that's another guy you know eight years of experience virginia tech 30 years old 511 194 decent Decent player in the NFL. Nothing spectacular. Nothing that's going to really jump off the page. At one time, he probably was, you know, a top-ish cornerback here and there. In Chicago. In, in Chicago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, somebody back in. That these, these are the guys we're going to be we're scrounging, we're going to be scrounging for a waiver wire. You know, might be right before camp or a late camp signing. I don't think you're going to be signing anybody now. I, well, I don't. I don't think we have the cap space. <laughs> but, right, well, we had six million before we. Uh, before we did we- let two people go today. Who did we let go today? Uh, Rice and John and one other player. Oh, I liked actually Rice and John before he got hurt. Yeah. He actually showed more than David Sills. 84. Look at that. Remember the number. <laughs> I know. I'm proud of you. I got my I got my David Sills jersey hanging up. West Virginia. His David Sills West Virginia jersey. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that's what I get. That's what I got hanging up. If David Sills sent me a jersey, I'd send it back. COD. Uh, but, uh, but is there anyone else? I mean... You know a Dory is going to be. That's a Dory. You know he's going to be the CB1. My ner- my Honestly, Tim, what makes me more nervous, and I think we're going to actually be signing multiple of these guys, and um, you maybe you can even talk about your little plan in your spreadsheet that you covered in a video, which you can find on, on uh, online Big Blue. Online Big Blue Sports. Uh, yeah. They're talking about, about my rotational cap space. Because I think we're going to have to sign a couple of these guys. Maybe we can get a Kyle Fuller. Maybe we can get a Jimmy Smith and sign them for a veteran minimum. Seven year, oh, seven year veteran minimum is one point seven. Uh, one point, yeah, hundred. It's like one point seven five million or something. I can't remember. Top of my head, I forgot what the veteran minimum. So it's a little over a million. I know that for a seven year veteran. He's so it, it's it, to me, it's really interesting. I think there's multiple. I mean, there's we're we're going to be scratching the bottom of the barrel. That's just that's just the way it is. 
Well, as, as, long like, as, not, as long as we're not scratching our balls, I think we're, I think we're, I think we're good. For those that do not know what OGR was talking about, I did a video and I referred to it as rotational cap space. I said basically what you need to do is you need to take your last five or six spots on the roster and fill those with either undrafted free agents with between one to two years of service, and then potentially two guys that have over five to six years experience, and use those cap space numbers as a puzzle piece that you can interchange vis-a-vis -vis who you're playing talent-wise and who you need on the roster. So this way you save your cap space and you stash these guys onto the practice squad, remembering the fact that you can protect three practice squad players on Thursday before the game starts so you have these guys that can mesh in with each other and not screw up the salary cap. And, um, yeah, and there's, there's guys out there. You've got Chris Harris. We all know Chris Harris. Uh, Joe Hayden. I keep hearing I keep hearing Joe Hayden. I remember Joe Hayden from Cleveland. I think Bryce he was. Callahan he, he was I think Joe Hayden was in Pittsburgh at one point in time as well. Um, he's another interesting guy that I keep hearing that name bandied about. Former and, first round draft choice. Mm -hmm. And then there's a couple safeties I can point out. But. Like what? We'll point out a safety. Uh, Jaskar Tatar is still available, um, which is a former San Francisco safety. And then you have a guy that I'm interested in, but I don't think we can sign. He's 25 years old. Terrell Edmonds, former Pittsburgh Steelers. I actually remember him. And I don't think we're going to sign him. No, he I don't would, think we're going to would, He would be a, he would be an inter, interesting piece. He wouldn't be a Madre Harper, because I know how much you like that name. Uh, well, he would be he would be an interesting he would be an interesting selection if the Giants could bring him in. A guy that I that I wanted and I thought was maybe affordable for the Giants early in free agency. A guy that I've always liked because I thought he was very – he's always underrated and he performs no matter where he is is Tyron Matthew. I've liked him since college. But it's well, unfortunate. Yeah, also, we're, not, we're, not signing, we're not signing the Honey Badger. He's already signed. Yeah, he's already signed. <laughs> he's already signed. We, we don't have the money for – we don't have the money for James Bradbury. We're sure not as hell going to have the money for the Honey Badger. <laughs> that's, that's not going to work out. Right now, like I said, we're still a little ways away from camp, regular camp, regular training camp. But is there and outside of the safety position and the cornerback position, is there a position on this team that you are interested in seeing the battle for the roster spots? Well, the battle for the roster spots for me, I don't think there's gonna be anybody signing coming in and compete is wide receiver. Okay. Where these guys fall in the pecking order, where Victor Cruz or Victor Cruz. <laughs> sure, sure. I, I think Victor Cruz would wish that he was on the pecking order. I wish he was too. But uh, Sterling Shepard is what I meant to say. Okay. Victor, Victor Cruz light, if you will. Okay. Victor Cruz light. Victor Cruz 2.0. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm, you know, a story came out today talking about how, you know, where does he fall? Because he sees himself as the second best wide receiver on this roster. Woody might not be. I think as far as route running, he would, but as far as athleticism, no. But we have to look at total ability because, you know, you know, Kenny G is going to be hopefully a number one. And then you look behind him. I mean, is, is Kadarius Tony more than a slot guy, but you can't really use him as a slot guy because you have. Wendell Robinson. Wendell Robinson, exactly. As your, as your slack guy. So you need someone, you need someone on the outside. And I love it because people still talk to this day about, well, he's a pinball. He's a juker. That Kadarius Tony, he could play on the outside. He could do all these. You know what? You get jammed by a 6'3 corner on the line. You're not gonna juke much. No, you're not. <laughs> That's <laughs> why a lot of people write off Darius Slayton. Right. And Darius Slayton is what you need in a number two. Yes. Is he the most consistent guy? No. No. Can he improve? Yes. Should he improve? Yes. Has he improved? Very, very not much. So, and he needs to stop dropping the ball. Because how often do you see Darius Slayton streaking down the sideline, ball over the shoulder, perfect placement by Daniel Jones, shockingly, drops the ball? Uh, I'm going to say not many times <laughs> because, because I can remember a bunch of games last season that I saw Darius, uh, the Tampa game comes to mind, a couple other ones that we saw Darius Slayton streaking down the sideline, one-on-one -on -one coverage, two steps on his defensive guy, defensive back, and Daniel Jones never looked. 
Never looked. I mean, he could be waving. He could be waving his arms. Now, people seem to forget with Darius. And I want to talk about Darius for a minute because I kind of wrote him off as well. I'm not going to lie. But then I looked at what he did statistically last year. Now, if you take a look between 2019, 2020, he averaged 745 yards and he had 10 touchdowns, excuse me, 11 touchdowns between those two seasons right off the bat. His catch percentage was in the 50s, was 57 and 52%. And I'm a big guy on catch percentage because that's the amount of times you caught the ball when it was thrown to you. Now, last year, it dropped down to 44.8% his catch percentage. But you know what's interesting? And this is what's funny because every we are always blasting him. Yes, he missed three games, but he was only targeted. Just He was targeted 84, 96 times the first two seasons. How many times do you think he was targeted last year? Targeted last year because we had guys that had noodle arms and couldn't throw downfield after Daniel Jones was injured. I'm going to say 40. Close, 58. He was targeted 58 times. If you take a percentage between 96 and 84 and average that out, he was targeted over almost 28% less last year than he was the previous two seasons. And people keep talking about the noodle arms, but Daniel Jones played 11 games last year. Yeah, he, he, he missed. He missed six, but he also played 11 and he wasn't targeting Darius when he was playing. And, and, I, and, I and that's a problem. That's an interesting thing. And that's a problem. But honestly, I don't think it was, I don't, yeah, yes, a large part of it was Daniel Jones. I'm not trying to excuse him because me and you are not the biggest Daniel Jones fans. But at the end of the day, I will say this, our offense was too safe. Now, maybe it's because they didn't trust the offensive line. Maybe you didn't have reliability of a run game. But eventually, you have to get aggressive. You have to let the peacock fly. And I understand where this conversation is going. But regardless, at some point, you've got to say, I'm not going to do the same thing over and over again and make this, you know, expect, you know, expect the same result, you know. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with this because you walked right into my trap. Uh, as a trap. So make sure you get those star destroyers out of the way before the Death Star fires. You walked right in, you walked right into my trap. Daniel Jones statistically played more games in 2020, but had similar Im- eerily similar stats than he had in 2021. They're not they're not much different. But if you look at Darius Slayton and the number of times he was targeted, now he wasn't active for four games, but the number of times how many times do you think Darius was targeted? Nine times and above. I'm going to say three times. Once. How many times do you think Darius Slayton was targeted at least eight times? Twice. Zero. He was targeted seven times, three times, and he was targeted six times once, five times once. Then it it falls into three, three, four, one, two, one. Three. That's that's not Darius Slayton not producing. That's the quarterback not looking his way. Yes, and that is true. But how many times is that purely on Daniel? How much is that on the offense? We don't know. It's not just always on the quarterback. I know a large portion of that is we want to sit there and blame Daniel for everything, but there's 53 members on the team, Tim. It's They're not, on. and plus the coaching staff. There's, it's not all on Daniel. I'm not trying to defend Daniel. He's been piss poor, to say the least. But some, there's more right. to it. I'm, no, the Dable's coming out and saying I wait, want to let the peacock fly. You I'm walked. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You walked into my second trap. <laughs> uh, it's a sucker trap. How many times last year do you think Daniel Jones threw over 30 passes in a game? That's over 30 passes. That would be over the league average. I'm going to say not many. I'm going to say f- four times. You ready for this? I'm going to count for you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. <laughs> Nine, 37, 32, 35, 40, 51, 33, 32, 38, 30. 
I'd be, I'd be curious to see the spread of different wide receivers and who was targeted. Here, here, here you go. <laughs> I came prepared. I came prepared today. No, I didn't. I lied. I didn't come prepared today. The tar- the, if you look at the, who was who was targeted, that's the that's the interesting thing. If you go by total targets, it's a myriad. It's a mixture. It's a mixture between you know every everyone on the team. It's not like he has that. You know what they always say? He, he's distributing the ball. He's he's getting the ball to different players in different times, and I think that's great. That you're, but you, to me, you're not seeing the entire field. If you're if you're missing the guy that is supposed to be your number two wide receiver on this team, you cannot tell me targeting your number two guy only fifty times is an acceptable situation for your starting quarterback. It is an acceptable situation, but again. It's not necessarily all on. The well, I'm not, I, I am not saying it's all on the quarterback. I am not saying it's all on the quarterback whatsoever. I, I'm I'm not saying that at all. But I just find it interesting that we only targeted Kenny seventy six times. Yeah, that's more than Darius. And yes, and most people will complain and say, "Well, you know, we didn't target him when Jason Garrett was playing. His per average is higher." Minus the three games he he was hurt. His per average, if you take out those three games and make it even, is a, is a little bit higher per uh, per attempt towards him with Jason Garrett. I'm curious to see the average length of throw that Daniel had. Well, all those stats in front of me, and, but you well, do. Here, here, here we go. You, you need that stat. I will give. I will give you that stat. His average yard completion was six point seven three. And what is the league average? It's over seven. I can tell you that because I did a video last year that says you need to complete. This is where I'm going with this. See, this was this was always going somewhere. This I've said this before. The it's like seven and a half is the average yards per catch he's 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 under that so it's not to me it's not the fact that i'm blaming all this on daniel jones but i've said this a million times there had been multitudes of occasions and it's not just darius that we had guys open deep that daniel jones had the time to throw because he held on to the ball i think the fourth longest last year of, every, of out of the 32 quarterbacks. So, which means he's got the pocket presence and he's got the, well, not pocket presence, but he's got the time to throw the ball, but he's just not processing and looking deep. And that is indicated by the fact that his yards per ca- attempt is lower than the league average. See, I, Tim, I don't want to be this guy that wants, or that's also bashing Daniel consistently. Right. I just don't want, I don't want to be that guy. Because this would just this podcast turned to a bash for Daniel Jones. But I don't think it's so, bashing uh, Daniel Jones. It is in a way because I think it's pointing. You know I, mean? out, I think it's pointing out his a flaw in his game. That's not bashing. People point at flaws in me all the time. They say how handsome I am. They say how wonderful I am. You know, I, I have to deal with those flaws. Yeah, you're and you're a teddy bear too. I'm um, a teddy bear. Yeah, but the reality is, you're not a piranha. Everybody thinks you're a piranha. You just snap at some people. You're not. You're a teddy bear. But anyways. The reality is we don't think Daniel's the future of this team. And that is probably one of the larger reasons why. But we also, I go back to our coaching staff. I go into our coaching philosophy. And it didn't matter if it was Jason Garrett. It didn't matter if it was uh, the other name we don't mention Pat on Sherman. this channel. Oh, well, yeah, okay, yeah. I'm not Pat Sherman. Well, Pat Sherman, yes. Yeah, so. it, it doesn't matter. We were too safe with the ball. We never kept defenses guessing. I could have told you what we were going to run. Right. And I'm a layman. And if I can do that, then the defense knows. They know we were too damn safe with the ball. And eventually you have to chuck it deep. You have to, you know, teams just crowd the box and say, Saquon, either you're going to beat us and these team, this team is going to have a miracle game blocking eight men in the box because Daniel isn't going to beat us. Do you, do and, you, want, do you, do you want to fall into trap number three now? Because all, all, all this was a trap. Do you want to fall into trap number three? Trap number three. You, we can agree upon that 19 was Daniel Jones's best season. Correct. 
because he had 24 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, 12 interceptions. They all they happened in five games. Majority no, 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 of them. no. I'm not, I'm not even going to get into that. I'm not even going to get into that. But we can all agree that that is his best season. Correct. Right? What do you think his yards per reception was in the 2019 season? I'm praying to God it's closer to seven. 6.59. It was lower than it is last year. So he has not consistently been looking down the field under the offensive guidance and genius of Pat Shermer. He actually checked down more in 19 than he did in 2021. But the reality is, Tim, the production deep was better in 19 than it was here, even though the yards per attempt was not. How many times do you think he hit the league average in 19? Because again, this is they did these are undisputable facts. How these many are times, undisputable facts. I'm just how many you, times do you my, think he hit? I'm, the league I'm telling average. you what I saw by my eye. I and know my eye could but, be lying. The, but the eyes are deceptive. How many times do you think he hit the league average? If that, you're asking me, it's not high. Well, just take a guess. It's going to be an incredibly low number. Three. Twice. Damn, I was hoping I was I was brutally wrong. <laughs> Twice he hit the league average in, the, in that season. What two games was the league average? I think I know. Two. The league average was he it versus Detroit. I knew it. And uh, it was versus Detroit, and it was what you call it. It was uh, versus the Jets. And you know what? He actually looked good in the Jets game. I was at that game live. It was the Jets. <laughs> I think. Hey, I, I think I will look good against. You, the I, am, year. I am shocked. You lost Washington game last game of the season that year. That's not close to the ever. What is that that thing? Because that that oh, so, yes, he was, it was the Washington game as well. There was three games. I apologize. There's a Washington game. I was right, Tim. It was three. Did games. you order yeah. the code red? You, you're damn right. I ordered the code red. <laughs> it was three games. It was eight point three eight. Yeah, that last game. So, but this is my thing. Everyone talks about the deep ball presence of Daniel Jones and how they didn't let him and how they didn't let him fly. They didn't. I can, you can't keep me cooped up in here, okay? I am a peacock. You got to let me fly. But statistics, which a lot of people love, especially pro football focus, do not back that conversation. Do not support. The data does not support. And I've always said this. As things get further away in memory, they get built up bigger and bigger. But statistically, it doesn't prove that he has been a good deep ball quarterback since day one in this league. And, I mean, you make a good point. A lot of it is on Daniel not looking downfield, you know, staring down his first read. And this is why the Giants need another quarterback in the future because I just don't see how Dable and wanting to let the peacock fly is, is Daniel going to be successful. And a lot of people probably think I'm a Daniel defender the way you have me running no. into traps. Oh no, listen, I, I am, I am not, I am, like I said, I am not bashing. This is not a bash fest of Daniel Jones and, and the people that held out the 43 minutes right now, I probably, probably not even listening at this point in time. Cause I think I'm bashing. I'm not bashing him. I am backing facts with statistical data that shows that it wasn't just 2021 as an aberration with him not checking down or throwing down deep, but having more of a tendency to take the shorter, safer pass. And maybe that's, that's could be philosophy too. And maybe that's what, no, no, is. Pat Shermer was the gunslinger. He, he I was, know, he I, I, I know, but what, I, what, I, what I'm saying is the stat, statistical data show me that yes he does check down now was was that something he was taught was that something that was installed in him or going back to college is that who he is and you have to go back further i don't know and that's a conversation for another day that is a conversation for another day hold on one second i gotta cut hold on one second you know what RG, OGR, talk for a minute i gotta i gotta i gotta answer a question here come come up with a new topic really quick all right come up with a new topic real quick who is OGR's favorite fullback of all time? I'll give you the answer because you probably didn't guess it. Maurice Carthon. Charles Way. Oh, I like Charles Way. I like Charles Way. Didn't Charles Way have 600 yards rushing one season? Pretty darn close. And I watched Jerry Glanville drool over a three-yard run. 
I'll always remember that. You will, you'll all, you'll always, re, you'll always remember that'll always be in, in the, in the oh, yeah. He side. drew it up like it was John Madden. Did you see how he hit the hole? I, it was, it was a run out of bounds. And I think he bounced off the first guy and then scooted out of bounds. And he was just highlighting that one play, three yard run. You know, Charles Way is another one of those, uh, another one of those Giants players that, you know, he, he was, he was, I, w- I wouldn't say he was on. I mean, he wasn't on the team for, a, for an extended period of time because he came out of Virginia. I remember that. And he was a six round pick, but I don't remember how long he played for with the team. I think he played five years. I think it's about that. I'm I don't, I don't remember. Cause I know I said he had, I, I know he had the ones I remember the one big season. And I think it was in, in either 96 or 97 that he had. I know, he know he had over, uh, 600 yards. I know he did one year. I just don't remember what year it was, but I just, I just remember that Charles way was, um, he, he had that, he had that one big year and then everyone thought that he was going to be like this continuation of, you know, one of the, the next gi- great giant running backs. Yeah. Wade's break. Yeah. 97 was his breakout year. He was a starting half back after Hampton went down with the injury. We made most of his opportunity at 696 yards. And gained one thousand one all-purpose yards and scored five touchdowns for yeah. rushing. And he was he was he was like I don't remember how tall he was, but he was a big guy. He was like two hundred fifty pounds. Yeah, I mean yeah. he was he he was not a he was not a Charles Way was not a small man. No, he was definitely not. I mean weight wise, I know he was like around 250, 250. And he played from the Giants from nineteen ninety five to nineteen ninety nine. So he did play five years. Yep. <laughs> and it doesn't list that. I think he retired after that because does not have any other team. Listed. He did retire. He had, I believe, he had an injury that forced him to retire. I want to say he had an injury, and I can't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, and he well, Way currently works for the NFL as a head of player engagement department oh. prior to joining the NFL in uh, two, July four, uh, two thousand fourteen. That's that's actually that's that's actually pretty interesting. But I want to get back just to Daniel Jones a second. I don't think we're bashing Daniel Jones. I don't think I've said this a million times. We don't win without Daniel Jones because we don't have a quarterback that could be the future of this team because it's not going to be Tyrod Taylor. And that's a burning question that I think a lot of Giants fans are have 2023 circled on their calendar for a reason. Because we're getting the kid from Florida. If we get Richardson, I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot somebody. <laughs> I think a lot of Giant fans have 2028 20, and the Archie Manning draft circled on their calendars. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? If they do, they got some problems because you need a quarterback. We need a franchise quarterback. We need a franchise quarterback now. But I don't want people to think because I'm not. It's not you. It's me. It's not you. It's me. How many times you heard that? It's not you. It's me. Or how many times you said it? Um, that usually means when the relationship is going to end, Tim. Is, is this the last episode of 312 and 1? Is not, that what you're telling me, Tim? This is, this Did is, you order the cold red? You're damn right I ordered the cold red. <sighs> Great movie. You know what the worst part is about that movie? That's not even the worst part. You know what the worst part of that movie is? I love that movie. And this is, I mean, again, I'm going to date myself. I had that movie on Laserdisc. Not a CD, not a VHS, on a late, cutting edge, '90s technology, laser disc. <laughs> they're like this. People that don't know, they're like this freaking big. <laughs> I like when he sends that he gets the two guys working the ground crew. Oh yeah, to, to, to come in before before Tom Cruise gets him to admit it on the stand, and he was like, "Yeah, I got the guys from Andrew's Air Force Base. What were they going to say? Nothing." I like the fact when he's he's uh, debating the guy that smoked the oregano, and he's and, and the guy's like Dave, you seem distraught, and he goes and he goes, Kathy, you know, there's not a hang your boy from a fucking yard arm, and he looks at Kirby and says, Kirby, they, does the Navy still help hang people by the yard arm? And he goes, I don't think so, <laughs> and he goes, Kirby doesn't think they still hang people by the yard arm. <laughs> That's one of my favorite parts. That's one of my favorite parts of them. I like I said, I've watched that that movie, Big Trouble in Little China, and a couple other ones that I, I've I probably have beyond memorized. But you know, we don't want to talk about movies. We've gone our we've gone almost our entire hour here. And I've done all the talking about and I've done all the 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 question giving. I want to know what's on the mind of OGR. What's on my mind of OGR? Well, and that's going to be a new segment. 
What's on what the mind? What is on the mind OGR. of OGR? Wow. I like wait it. To, wait, wait to warn me, right? Like, literally, people, if you don't know this, he literally just, he he's doing this live. He's throwing at me live. Like, he did not give me any prep. He just throws it at me. He sees what sticks, and he goes, let's go with it, OGR. You know what's on my mind court right now, as far as the Giants go? Quarterback. Quarterbacks okay. is on my mind, and quarterbacks next year's draft. And I'm going to drive this point home until people are sick of me talking about it. We are not going to get Bryce Young, and we are not going to get C.J. Stroud. So you're saying we're not going to be bad enough. No, I don't. I think this team is going to start off terrible. 0-5, 0-6. Obviously, we'll know better when the schedule comes out, which is, I believe, tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not even sure. And tomorrow we'll be better. And this team is going to rally down the stretch. It's going to be very similar to what Brian Flores did in his first year with Miami, where everybody thought they were the worst team in the league and they didn't end up being, even though arguably they had the worst talent in the league. That's what you think is going to happen. <laughs> and I, I think that's what's going to happen. And a lot of Giants fans are going to be disappointed because in next year's draft, unless the Giants are in love with a Will Levis, a Richardson out of Florida. The kid out of Boston College, I can't say his last name. It starts with a Z. Okay, I'm, I'm going to assume he's Polish. A guy I like, Jaron Hall out of BYU. Unless you're in love with one of these guys, or or Tim's favorite, Spencer Rattler. Um, Using that as an example. You better be looking at different quarterbacks because I don't think the Giants are going to – and a lot of people are going to trade up, trade up. Well, let's let's go through a quick scenario, Tim. Let's say the Detroit Lions has a second pick like they did this year. And let's say the Jets are number one. I'm not telling you the Jets are gonna be the worst team in the league, but I guess I am if I I was like, I think you're already telling me that now. <laughs> now yeah, the Jets drafted a quarterback. If they're now drafting number one there's an argument they could take another. Arizona did it with Josh Rosen and Kyler Murray. They did. So why wouldn't the Jets? Now, I, I, you're the Giants. What are you going to do? You, you're going to pull an Ernie Acorsi and give away your – knowing you're still going to have Swiss cheese on this team or or, or or the Giants fans sitting there and be like, you know what, let's go into free agency and, and try and get all the best players and, and repeat the same mistakes. No, the Giants aren't going to trade up. There's still still too many holes in this team, even after a year of drafting these guys, depending on how everybody lands. So tell me, Tim, am I wrong? No. And I would be shocked, though, and I would laugh at the Giants if the Jets were, were the worst team and they took a quarterback after their other quarterback has only been in the league for two years. And then it would show me, though, it would show me, though, that most teams understand after two seasons, if you don't have something on a quarterback, you get rid of them. You move on. You don't wait to where you don't wait to year four to say, well, he could turn the corner. But I, you know what I think also? I think Atlanta is going to be bad this year. And they're going to need a quarterback. Hey, absolutely. I mean, they did take Mr. Ritter. So we'll see. And that's another guy we liked over, uh, you know, not like as much as Malik, but nope. a guy that had a potential to develop. But again, if you were Atlanta and you're sitting in one of the top two spots or in top three spots and you are in love with Bryce Young or CJ Stroud, are you going to pass because you got Desmond Ritter? No, you, you, you're, you're, you're taking one of those guys. If you're, taking, they, if, you're taking one of those guys. Assuming they don't pull a Spencer Rattler, assuming they don't pull a two total by lower. That's the key, but that's the key, and that's that's the situation. And I and I I I, I don't disagree with you, whatso whatsoever. <laughs> with, and, with, and that has been my my biggest pressing thing because Giants fans just develop the team this year, get the offensive line set, get the defensive line set. Even though you're going to be losing, you know, Leonard Williams isn't long to be a Giant for more than the next two years. And same with Mister. Um, Dexter Lawrence, even though we signed him, he'll be here next year, but he's not longed after that. And if we're going to be pay attacking this 3-4 system, the Giants are also going to need to find defensive ends or 3-4 defensive ends. Right. 
to go in here in this roster. And if the none of these corners pan out, the Giants are going to be a corner needy team. What are we just going to go into free agency? We're just going to go spend big money. You've already seen how frugal Jones Shane is. He's not going to make the same mistakes of a Dave Gettleman and a Jerry Reese trying to, you know, figuratively save his job. Throwing, money, to throwing money, throwing money at overpaying players to fix the team. And that, teams, and that is my biggest, that's my biggest craw. And I just wonder next year where, if you're a Giants fan, and especially if you listen to this on YouTube, put it in the comment section. Where do you think the Giants are going to finish? And you can find this podcast at Finish It Off for Me Tim. Any place that podcasts are available. <laughs> and and YouTube on online big blue sports entertainment. I, I did want to bring this up. I do want to do a little housekeeping. We're doing the first three episodes on online big blue sports entertainment. There will be a designated podcast channel for episode four. It will be three, twelve, and one. The two, the two thousand twenty-two New York Giants. So you will still be able to find it anywhere podcasts that are available, but it will have its own podcast channel. Because if anyone that knows anything about podcasting, the first thing they always tell you is before you start a podcast channel, have at least three to four episodes available in your library. So please check it out, and, and uh, probably not, not this week, and this week is the week of the ninth, but it will be the following week, which would be the week of the sixteenth. But you will find us at 312 and 1, the 2022 Giants. Do you have any other final thoughts, Mr. OGR Sports? My final thoughts is if you're a Giants fan, this is a, a, essentially a lost year unless they, you know, Daniel Jones comes out and balls and becomes league MVP, which I'm not betting on that. And I am a betting man. So you are a betting man. Yes, I am. And you can, you can follow my picks at, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> Why not? Jimmy the Greek made money doing that. <laughs> and he, no, couldn't you even, he couldn't even give picks out onto the air. Oh, uh, but you know what? The reality is it's a wait and see approach. Yep. Go through rookie mini camp, soak up what you can in, uh, you know, over uh, camp and, you know, the games that we paid over the summer before, obviously game start and you will be able to see me and tim at one of those games potentially potentially we are going to a game we are going i that you you can you can put that in the bank because we are going to be attending the game we'll be out in the parking lot greeting people actually we'll be out in the parking lot collecting tickets because <laughs> you know who the hell wants who the hell wants us at the game even though we are two dapper gentlemen and you know what guys that's the end of today. It's 312 and 1. It's episode number three. This is Tim. This is OGR saying thank you and see you next week.